Okay, every year people ask me what they should get their swimmer for Christmas, and I always tell them the same thing. Get a pair of drag socks made by Aquavolo. It's the perfect stocking stuffer for any swimmer. Honestly, there's no simpler training tool to build power in the water than a pair of drag socks. Go to aquavolo.com and use the code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout and save 10%. The offer's good only through November, so order now. All right, David Plummer, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Doing all right. How are you, Brad? I'm good, bud. I'm good. Where, where are you coming from right now? I'm uh, actually sitting at work just outside Minneapolis in Minnesota. What do you do for work now? I am the uh, vice president at, of operations at Premier Sports Psychology. Oh, wow. So well, what's your daily day to day? Yeah. So, so really we're, you know, I, I think the largest sports psychology firm in the country um, and, and we're kind of going, going through a big growth phase and I'm, I'm really just trying to kind of keep all the operations and, and structure in place. So, so everybody can kind of get out and get out and do their own work. So uh, a lot of, a lot of internal management and structure and sort of managing growth and, but yeah, it's a it's a fun project and a fun uh, fun group of people to to be working with. How many people are in the group? I think we're at twenty or twenty one now. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, do you actually do the sports psychology yourself, or you just manage them? No, just just work internally. Um, I I do a little bit of like leadership development work with teams. Yeah. Um, but, but nothing on the, the performance or psychology side. I leave, leave that to the, uh, the, the ones with the PhDs. I do get to, you get a chance to talk to them and listen to any oh, stories and stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of the cool thing about, about my work is, you know, just, we, we get to look at, you know, the impact on athletes from so many different perspectives, right? Um, we have people who consult with, you know, professional front offices and, you know, division one coaches to, you know, just doing a lot of athlete work from, from youth sport up to the Olympic and pro levels. So it's a, it's a really fun, fun group to, to work with. And um, yeah, some of the conversations we have are just, just a blast for sure. This is an area of, uh, of sports and performance and athletics that has really taken off, you know, I, I don't know when it took off, but within the last certainly 10 years, it's been an explosion in terms of sports psychology. So um, where is it now as to where it was maybe 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I think our, our firm just, you know, kind of as a reference is about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody told our owner, like, there's no way you're going to make it in sports psychology, you know, yeah. like, you better have a backup plan. Um, and and all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's, you know, the owner of a company with with 20 people working for it consulting all across the place. Um, you know, different levels and organizations. But I, I think the, the biggest thing that we're seeing and in, in more from the, the mental health standpoint is yeah. we're just seeing more issues, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people are coming into college with, with significant mental health issues. Um, and that obviously affects performance, right? Um, so we're, we're just seeing more and more of that. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good space to be in, unfortunately, sort of an, a necessary space to be in because we're, we're just seeing some of those mental health statistics really, really, you know, soaring, which is, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, um, doing good work. Keep it up. Uh, definitely a need out there and definitely an area of growth for, for sports performance. It's, I, I love it. I think it's amazing. So yeah. um, a lot of what I talk about with, with my guests on the podcast is, you know, sports performance and, um, yeah and how they handle certain situations. So um, really good stuff. But, you know, when I look at your career, uh, super interesting because you were, you were uh, competing against probably the, the toughest group of uh, specific athletes in U S history. I think if you look at, if you look at men's backstroke over the last uh, well, we could go all the way back to Lenny Kraselberg, I guess. Let's go. Maybe even before that. Uh, who was the Who was the one before Lenny? It was Jeff Rouse. Yeah, yeah. That you got Jeff Rouse, and um, so it's just like American backstroke has just been so dominant on the world stage. Why on earth would you want to be a backstroker? 
I have no idea. It's a <laughs> terrible, terrible idea. Um, but I, I just wasn't very good at anything else. So <laughs> kind, of, kind of the only option to me. But, uh, but yeah, I think, I think I actually raced Jeff Rouse once. Um, oh, wow. So he, he did that kind of year out of retirement where he came back and swam at a nationals and, and beat me at nationals when I was, <laughs> I think, 17 or 18 years old. So, yeah. so you got them all. You got Jeff Rouse, you got Lenny, you got – Pearsall, you got, I mean, who are the others? Throw some others in there. Yeah, I mean, the the guys that stand out are like guys like Peter Marshall and Randall uh-huh. Ball, uh-huh. Uh, you know, Nick Thoman, obviously, yep. Grievers, um, Subarats, short course. That guy was a, just a terrible guy to race. Um, <laughs> so, so fast underwater. Um, then you finish with Murphy. Yeah, yeah Lochte and then, oh, you Lochte know. and Murphy, yeah. yeah. Lochte and Murphy, yeah. Uh, so it's... Uh, so it's a tough lineup for sure. It's a tough lineup. <laughs> wow. And, and look, we'll go through your career, but I mean, looking at it, you, you were super successful in all but one area right up until the end. And that was making the Olympic team. Um, so it's, it's an interesting uh, path and, and I kind of want to go through it, but first of all, like, um, you know, where did it all start for you in the beginning? Yeah. So, um, you know, for me, I, really started super young because my, my mom taught swim lessons. Okay. Um, so we were, we were kind of just little pool rats, you know, we were mm-hmm. just always around the water. And um, I think, I think I was on, on a competitive team just, just because we were there when I was about five years old. So um, it was, it was just kind of something that we were, we were always involved in, you know, my, my two older brothers swam and minivans going to the pool and that's where I'm going to end up. And you grew up in uh, Oklahoma, correct? Oklahoma, yeah. Yeah, wow, wow. So then you, you go through high school and you, you, you're you pretty decent. Are you getting recruited by the best teams in the country uh, at the end of high school? You know, I, I had a handful. Um, I, I, th- I think there were a handful that didn't look at me. Like, I, I'm pretty sure, like, Eddie in Texas didn't look at me mm-hmm. simply because my underwaters were atrocious. Okay. Uh, they were, they were so bad. So I was, I was a a really decent long course swimmer and I was, I was, I think, I think the top hundred backstroker coming out my year, but, um, what year was that? Uh, Oh, four coming out of high school. So it was right after, you know, the year after grievers. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I I took recruiting trips to, to Florida and Georgia and Arizona state and ended up going to, to Minnesota. Um, but, but yeah, I think there was just such a an obvious gap short course with with my underwaters. Why'd you end up picking Minnesota in the end? Yeah, I, I my older brother swam there, um, and I got to you know got to know Kelly through through his experience, and, and got to know Dennis and and the other coaches. So it just it just felt like a really good fit. Um, obviously, you know, still still around in Minneapolis, but I, I love the cities and love the state and. Um, I, I love the school, you know, just loved being part of the sort of the big, big school atmosphere. So you, you swam college, what, oh, five, six, seven, and eight. Was that they your four years? Yep. yep. And who, who was the top backstroker in college during that time? Grievers. Um, Grievers was, was great. Thoman, Thoman was really fast. Um, Ben Hessen, Ben Hessen was a, mm-hmm. a monster underwater, um, those are, are probably the the biggest guys, but they, and then a couple of guys, obviously in the 200 Lochte was still around for a couple of years. Um, Patrick Shirk out of Penn state, I raced, uh, um, oh, what's his name from Michigan, the 200 backstroker. Um, Tyler Clary. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, I actually don't think we overlapped in, in college. It was a guy before Tyler that was, was okay. really, really good. Um, but, but yeah, so those were kind of the, yeah. the, the list that, that I was, I was trying to keep up with. Did you get better at your underwaters and in that four years? Not as good as you would have hoped. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, the problem? I mean, you, you know, know, I look at pictures of your legs. You had some big legs. What was going on? I was just a just a bad kicker. Um, I I mean, it was everything. It was it was poor form. It was you know it was just something that that when when and where I was growing up was never nobody ever demanded it of me. Uh-huh. Um, so getting into college, I got better, but I think I was, I was nothing special. I was a 46 short course hunter backstroker coming out of college. Um, and, uh, and a 
53 long course on her backstroker. So it, it didn't really, didn't really line up to be honest. So why make the decision to continue swimming? You got all these incredibly gifted, talented beasts around you of backstrokers. <laughs> You're not that great coming out of college. So why, why'd you decide to try and make a run at, you know, competing for the U S yeah. Why, why subject yourself to that? That's a great question. Uh, no, it, you know, so I, I, it wasn't the plan to be honest, you know, my plan after 08 was to retire. Um, and, and I started coaching in Ohio. My, my wife was going to med school down there. Um, and I just kind of got back in the water in 2009 just because you know i had time it was it was fun um i got to try out a bunch of different training techniques that i'd never really tried before um a lot more sprint training i was i was kind of more of a traditional yardage guy growing up uh -huh. uh, so it was it was fun to just play around and it was kind of like yeah I'll go compete at nationals you know it's 2009 i'll throw on a suit and see what i can do um and nationals went okay i think i was in the the tier suit which was the lowest level of those super suits if you remember um yeah. and then I, I was this at a totally random speedo sectionals in in miami ohio and threw on one of those blue 70s and and win a time that would have put me on the olympic team a year before um uh -huh. And, and I went out that night and, and had some beers and woke up the next morning and let off the relay and went even faster. Um, so I think I, I was, I think I was 53 one at that meet, which was well, well, almost a full second faster than I'd ever been. Um, wow. and I think I was training four days a week. Um, and, and really it was sort of like, I, I can't let this go. You know, I'm, I'm, I obviously didn't reach my potential and I, I really want to reach my potential. Um, uh, so, so I, at that point, I made the decision to really get back into it. Wow. So who's training you from this point in 09 up until the trials in 12? Yeah. So I was working, I, I actually think you've met him. I think he came down and, and did a little, like uh, one of those coaches training things with you, but his name is Ben Bartel. Uh -huh. Yeah. He did. Um, yeah. So he, he uh, was just a friend of mine you know, um, good friend of mine that was, that was coaching a club team in Minnesota. And, um, we, we had kind of just talked a bunch, you know, bef before this about like, what would we do differently in our training, in our careers? Um, he was a big 10 champion and 200 backstroke, but it was like, what, what would we do now if we had the opportunity? And we, we kind of got the opportunity to do that and, and make a run together. So, so that was, you know, the next three, three or four years we, we spent together. Wow. So what, what kind of training are you doing in that time? Are you still training four times a week or are you upping it a little bit? No, we, we got back to it. Um, I mean, and, and that's the thing, like it, we got back to, you know, um, I was, I was probably nine, 10 practices a week, but not, not really doing any yardage at all. Like really kind of going to the full high intensity training, um, that you know michael andrews really sort of popularized right now um yeah but uh yeah got got back into the weight room I, that was the biggest thing for me was i i took weights as a professional just way way more seriously than i did when i was in college oh okay so that was the big deal you got stronger yeah, yeah. okay I, I think i went from uh when i graduated high school i was six three and 160 um to when I competed internationally, I was probably 210. Uh, wow. So yeah, it, it was quite quite a big difference in, in terms of strength for sure. Wow, so so you um, swim for a couple of years and then go back to the Olympic trials for a second time. What's your 2012 experience like? I was, it was actually actually the third. I, I just missed, missed out on the final in 2004. Um, oh wow. So, so yeah, the... Um, that experience was terrible um, in 2012, mm -hmm. and 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 not not necessarily because I didn't make the team, although that really sucked. Um, but but just the level of stress, you know, I was I had kind of done this thing where it was like I I set my goal as like I'm going to make the Olympic team, and that was the only goal. You know, mm -hmm. there was nothing around time, there was nothing around anything other than you know go to the Olympics and win a, win a medal. So it became like 
am I a total failure if I don't make the team? Is is all this time been wasted if I don't make the team? So the the pressure I put on myself was just was just through the roof. Um, and and I think that I was I was I was kind of that guy that I, I really studied everybody else. Um, and and like to to your point, trying to trying to tell yourself that you're gonna like I'm going to go beat Matt Grievers or I'm going to go beat Nick Thoman to put myself on the Olympic team was, it was, it was tough. So it was just a lot of, a lot of anxiety leading into that meet. And, and I, it, it was reflected in my swim for sure. What, what would you suggest to somebody that is going to be do, doing the same thing that you did, mm-hmm. you know, in the lead up to next year, 2012, uh, tw- uh, 21, I guess it is now Tokyo Olympics. So like, what would you suggest to anybody that's aiming for that Olympic trials or trying to make that Olympic team? How would have you have changed things? Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, it was like, the, well, uh, this is sort of a, a cop-out answer, but everything changed for me when, when my son was born in, in 2013. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not by any means advocating that everybody go out there and have a kid and that's, what's going to put you on the Olympic team. But, yeah. uh, but you, to me, the, the reflection changed, right. Of before it was, I want to make the Olympic team. And after it was, I want to make the Olympic team because I want my, I want my kids to be able to chase their dreams as hard as they can. So that the goal didn't really change, but the, the purpose behind it was deeper and it made it a lot easier to say, I'm going to go after this as hard as I can because, and that's the most important part. The outcome isn't the most important part. The process is, um, and how I go about my businesses because that's, that's what I want my kids to be able to take away. So I, I think that's that's my advice would be to to dive into the the process and and why you do it and why you love it as much as you possibly can because that makes it a hell of a lot easier to race free at the end of it. Actually, we we have similar stories. I didn't miss three Olympics, but I was, I certainly missed one in '96, and I felt like at that time I'd given it everything. I was training incredibly hard, doing crazy yardage. Um, and, and just missed the team, thought my Olympic run was over. Uh, fast forward, go to America and, and um, end up having a child in 1999. And, and it changed my perspective on everything, you know, and, and I agree with you in terms of the purpose. You know, I had a different purpose going into 2000. I had enormous pressure being at a home Olympics in 2000, but I, I knew without a doubt I was making that team. Um, whereas it was, com- it was a completely different mentality and feeling back in 96 when I'd missed the team. So I, I can certainly relate to you and, and I don't advocate people go out and have children either for, for that reason. But, uh, but it certainly, it changed my perspective on things uh, and it, it yeah. certainly helped in a way. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it just, just kind of makes everything you do just that much more purposeful. Right. And, and that's, that's a tough thing. Like I, it doesn't have to be tied to a kid by any means. It, it yeah. can be tied to whatever it is, but I, I do think it's, it's a really important step to say, why, why am I doing this? Why, why am I investing so hard? Um, you know, for me, sometimes it felt like the easy choice, right? Because the easy choice was what I've always known, just stick with what I've always known and try harder um, as opposed to go, go out and try something else in a new field. So the, the more I took time to say, this is, this is why I'm doing it. And it's really, really important to me. Um, and I'm okay with that. Um, and I'm okay with failure if it means, if it means I gave it my best, but, yeah. um, but I, I think anybody, anybody can, can, is capable of that level of reflection for sure. But to think you're going to make the Olympic team for the first time at age 30 <laughs> after missing it three other occasions is yeah, pretty far fetched, right? It, a little bit. Yeah. Um, a little bit, especially considering how good Ryan Murphy got in those four years. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You lose yeah. one and another one pops up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No kidding. Um, and, and again, like I, I always thought, you know, um, I, I had one of my favorite races that always stands out for me was, um, so in 2010, when I was kind of back training full time and everybody was like, what the hell are you doing with your life? Um, I, I went to nationals and, and just out touched Pearsall and, and won the meet in 2010. And nobody expected that except for me and my coach. Um, and, and, and really like 
the whole idea was, I think that there's a way to beat Pearsall. Um, and he was one of the most, I, I still think one of the best backstrokers of all time. Oh, for sure. But, but the whole strategy in that race was stay close enough, stay close enough and see if you can see if you can outspin him the last 10 meters into the wall. Um, say, same with Grievers. Like he was so freaking dynamic through his walls and he's an amazing backstroker. But if you can keep him close enough or if you can get speed on him early, you got a shot. Um, the tough thing for me was like, I don't know. I still don't know how you beat Ryan Murphy. Um, he, there's just not many gaps in his races, but that, that was the toughest thing to get over is like, you got to be able to tell yourself, like, I, I'm going to go try to beat these guys when you, when you really know how good they are. Well, that's what I mean. You're, you're coming into 16. Um, and, and there's a lot of challenges there's a lot of hills to climb to just to make that team but just in terms of your life at that point what's going on in your life because it looks t- your, your life in 16 looks totally different to what it looked like in eight when you're taking a run at that or even in 12 when you're taking a run at that so what does your life look like in the lead up to 16 you, you know I, th- I think the big the big differences are like leading into 12 i was a swimmer and that was it you know um that was the only piece of my life. Like I did some coaching, but I was really an athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, after, after 12, it was like, that's not an option anymore. Like, you know, one my, I got married, my wife and I had our first kid, but, but I was like, I just can't, I can't be only this one thing anymore. Um, so I got really a lot more intentional about coaching. Um, I, I actually, I started working with a sports psychologist and, um, the, to me, being a great athlete always meant, um, put that before everything else above everything else. And as much as I still feel like you have to prioritize it for sure, you have to give it your all. Um, you can't let it be the only thing. It, at least it didn't work that way for me. Um, and the more I said, you know, I, I, I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better father. Uh, husband to my, to my wife. I want to be a better teammate to the people around me. I want to be a better coach to these young athletes that I work with. The, the more it sort of rounded me out a little bit. Um, mm. It got, it got that much, much easier to show up for practice because I hadn't spent the last 24 hours obsessing over either a good or a bad practice the day before. Yeah. Wow. I, I love that, man. It's really good advice. And so I can certainly relate to all of that too. Um, so you know, you go to the Olympic trials and, and then that's kind of the moment of truth as well. So at that point, um, what have you done to prepare yourself to make this team? Like uh, just m- maybe even mentally, what are the things that you're saying to yourself or, or what are the processes that you're going through to make this team? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the, the couple of things for me that really stand out were, well, I, I, I got this great advice from, you know, my, my strength and conditioning coach, uh, his name's Cal Dietz. Um, he's the head, head strength and conditioning coach for, for USA women's hockey. Um, but, but he gave me this advice. I, I asked him once, like, what's, what's the difference between, you know, a good athlete and a great athlete. And he was like, a great athlete leaves no stone unturned. Um, so it was, it, it had to be everything, you know, if you're going to go from age 26 to age 30 and get better, you, you can't leave any stone unturned. So it was, it was nutrition. I'd never really taken my nutrition very seriously. I took it really seriously going into 16. Um, I, I did, I started, started working with a sports psychologist and, and tried to find, you know, it's, it's like the right activation level. What's, what's the difference between preparing for a 50 and preparing for a hundred, mm. uh, you know, you, you guys had to, to deal with that a lot more because you grew up some in the 50. Um, I, I got really into the long course 50 as a as a pro, but it was it was kind of crazy to me that like, oh, I, I got to approach these differently. You know, I need to be way more activated for a, for a 50 than I do 100. Um, so so just kind of reflecting on that and taking time to think about what what makes the most sense. Um and then, you know, I, I worked really closely with my coaches and, and Russell Mark at USA Swimming to say, what is what is a great race look like? What is my great, great race look like? What is what is the tempo that I need to hold? And and then it just became how do we align training to that? Um, you know, take this this ideal race I think I can have. And how do I 
how do I put everything into having that race? And, and that was kind of the cool thing was like, as much as I only had one shot, I was only swimming one race in 2016. It also meant everything with all of my preparation was towards that one race. Mm, I love it, man. I love the fact that you brought up Russell Mark too. I just did a podcast with him, which will be, nice. yeah. uh, it'll be coming out. So, uh, um, he likes to feel like he had some influence on people's careers. And, and for you to say that is, uh, will, will mean a lot to him, man. So, so thanks for bringing him up. Um, but yeah, little pieces like that, they go a long way. And, and you're right. Like when you, when you look at the puzzle, you can't leave a piece out to say, well, I I'm weak there and that's okay. I'll, I'll just, yeah. I'll pretend that that doesn't exist. It's like, no, you got to face your weaknesses. You got to address them. Because when you line up next to the best guys in America, which ultimately are the best guys in the world, you better be ready and you better have all those pieces in place and, and no, no weaknesses. You know, I, I mean, you, you're going to have areas where you better, but you yeah. can't have an area where you're completely uh, incompetent. So um, in terms of tightening things up for you in, in your swim itself, where did you have to be really good on that day? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing for me always was was sort of mitigate my my walls and, and turns, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I knew I wasn't going to, I'm not going to press anybody off the start. I'm not going to beat anybody off the off the turn, but I can't get destroyed there, right? Mm-hmm. It can't be, like you said, it can't be a weakness. It has to be just just not a strength, right? Yeah. Um, but, but the biggest thing really came down to tempo for me. Um, I, I was able at my best to hold hold somewhere in the one 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 two range, and I knew if I could if I could hold that one one high for the last about 10, 15 meters of the race, as long as I didn't screw anything up before that, I had a I had a chance to be at my best. Um, and that that was a big focus of of my training was how do we put as much stress and pressure um, on my body while still ho- trying to hold that tempo. Um, mm, mm, so that like was that. the biggest, like that was the biggest thing. I like that. Give me some examples where you would put stress on your body to hold that tempo. Yeah. I mean, it, a, a lot of, uh, like bucket work. Um, mm-hmm. if I was doing anything with resistance, it was almost, it would it, not almost, it was mandatory that I had that, that tempo. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I, you know, I, I worked with uh, later in my career. Worked with like Gideon Lowe and and a couple of a couple of those guys who mm-hmm. Gid was awesome at just demanding that of me. You know, and and wouldn't let me do reps if I wasn't getting there. Um, so it was it was you know a, a lot of uh, a lot of that that strength resistant stuff, and then just any race pace. It was and Gideon was big on like let's let's do, you know, two fifties or a bunch of 25s, no breath, and then go right into a 25 or 50 at pace at tempo. Mm. Uh, so it was just find all of the ways to put your body under stress and then see what you can do. Gideon had a good teacher. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> uh, no, that's good. I love it. I love the fact that, um, you know, th- those principles hold true, man. You got to put your body under stress because when you get to that point of stress, you want to maintain everything that you got going for. You don't want it to fall apart under stress. You know, you've got to get to that, like you said, that 80 meter mark and Ryan Murphy's up on you and you're like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to tempo up here. I'm going to maintain tempo and just hold him off. And, and that's it. So when you're in that ready room um, for the Olympic trials, who are the guys that you got to beat? I mean, you obviously had Murphy in there. Who who are the other guys in 16 that you had to get past? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really saw it as a three-way race. I mean, I knew I knew Pebbly ha- had what it took and was going to be good, but I, I didn't know that he could quite create the speed to go with with Matt, uh, with Griever's eye and Murphy. Um, mm-hmm. I, I really thought it was a was a three-way race. Um, and, and, you know, I, I did something that was, you know, looking back on it may have been stupid, really, um, leading up to that race and, and in, um, in the semifinal. So I was, so I was in the second semifinal and Murph and, and Grievers were in the first and Murph 
put down something stupid. Um, like I think he went like 52, three or 52, two, something, something really fast. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, it was mostly just for myself, but I was like, I need to prove right here, right now that I can make this team. And I, and I went, that was, that actually ended up being my, the fastest race I ever went was in that semifinal. I went 52 one. Oh, wow. Um, but I was like, I'm going to put myself in a position between these guys and, and sort of put them on watch that, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to make this team. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, going, going into the ready room was exactly that. I was, I was kind of sitting in the position I wanted to be in between Murph and Grievers. And, and it was, it was just sort of like, same thing, like put yourself under stress and see what you can do. And then as you're coming into the wall, like if you are at the 80 meter mark in that race, do you know where you're positioned or are you just, uh, staying focused on what you got to do at that point? You know, I, I, I could kind of see, um, Omaha's weird, right. Where like, if you're swimming backstroke, it's like, it's this weird temptation game. Cause you can, if you look up just for a second as a backstroker, you could watch the race. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I, I knew right where I was. I mean, I could see I was neck and neck with Murph and it, it seemed like I had the edge on, on Matt. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's almost one of those things that you like, don't, you kind of notice it, but you can't let yourself consciously say it's going on because you got 10 seconds left, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you got your hand on the wall. You make the team, uh, after you're, you're finally on your fourth attempt. That's pretty, pretty big deal, man. Uh, must be very emotional for you and your family. Yeah. You know, it, it was, uh, I, I always say like one of the, one of the coolest things that I got to experience was, um, you know, my, my family all got to be there. A lot of, a lot of good friends, close friends that I swam with, you know, like old friends from, from high school days in, in Oklahoma came up to watch. And I just had this, um, you know, I, I, I kind of sped through the whole process. I was like, when I leave this building, I want to be done. I don't want to come back. So before I saw anybody, I actually like fully warmed down. I did my drug testing. I did everything. Um, and I, I got to go outside and, you know, see my, see my wife carrying my, my son and, and my, my mom actually walked out carrying my, my second son was six weeks old at that meet. Wow. Um, my, my mom came out just bawling. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was really was one of the, kind of the coolest experiences ever just to, just to be able to, to share that with everybody there. Awesome, man. Now, one of the, I went back to Australia a couple of years ago. They were trying to change their trials from, uh, you know, they had their trials about six months out of the Olympics and they were moving to more of a U.S. system where it was about five weeks or a month out of, of the Olympics. And they've been on that system now for a couple of years. And one of the things they wanted me to do is come down there and talk about that period of time. They want to, they felt like the U S did the best from the trials to the Olympics of either swimming the same time that they went or even swimming a little bit faster. And I know you're kind of in that category where you're around about the same time. So what's some advice, what's some things that you did well in that time period between the trials and Olympics to, to hit your time again? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I think that there's some, some things that went well, some things that, that definitely could have gone better. Um, I, I think that one of the tough things is like, it's, it's sort of a 15 minutes of fame, right. Um, where you go through pro probably what like a really good NFL athlete goes through on a daily basis where everybody's sort of paying attention. Right. So you get, you know, you, you're going to get more likes on Instagram and Twitter than you've ever gotten in your entire life. Right. People are, are just paying more attention. Yeah. So it's, it's this, uh, it's, it's tough to kind of turn that off a little bit. And, and I think that our, it, it's this balance, right. Where you have this opportunity to, to build a brand for yourself. Right. And, and that's what everybody wants in terms of sponsors. They want, they want likes, they want content, they want you to put something out there. Um, but at the same time, it's easy to get sucked into all of that stuff. And it's not really reality. Um, so I, I, I had to contend with that weirdly as like an old guy on the team. And, and, um, and I, I think I did okay with it, but, but it took, it took my attention in a way that I wasn't prepared for. Yep. Um, so, so I think that that was a little bit of a struggle and, and something that, that our coaches were pretty good at, you know, kind of keeping it, us on task with, of not, not trying to limit because they recognize the, the value, but, but saying there's a time and a place. Yeah. Um, 
but but I think the the other thing is just um, I, I always talked about you know so again I, I was swimming with Gideon at that time um, and internationally I worked with Jack Roach um, and I think that one of the things that went went really well for me was was Gideon and Jack just worked really well together um, they they were in constant communication um, so so Gideon who had worked with me a little bit longer a little bit closer was able to really give close feedback to, to Jack and Jack could kind of tell him what he would, he, what he was seeing, but there was just a lot of trust in all of those relationships. Um, and I think that that was, that was actually a really, really big piece for me was to just feel, feel, you know, sort of taken care of, um, mm. and have a lot of trust in the people that I was working with for sure. So did you go through a period where maybe you had a few days rest after the trials and then get back into some work, and then kind of go through a, a, a mini taper for the second time? Yeah, essentially. Um, I, I, and it was kind of weird for me because, you know, the hunter backs over early. So, so I'm actually kind of in and training again at trials. Hmm. I, it's still wrapping up those, those last few days. So that, that was kind of a weird experience for sure. But um, yeah, that, that's essentially it. I think we took it up for maybe just over two weeks and, and started coming down again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Well then how was your Olympic experience? You're pretty satisfied with it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was awesome. Um, I, I think it's one of those things that's sort of, sort of over too quick, right? It, you, you sort of blink and you miss it. Um, and, and again, you know, we, we had just had our, our second kid and by the time I had finished racing, I felt like I had missed about half of his life um, up until that point. So, so I, I didn't really get to get to go around to a lot of other venues the way I would have liked to, but, but man, it was, it was just an awesome experience to be, you know, part of team USA and do some of those, those things together. I'm looking at this uh, morning relay that you swam on where it's, it's you Cordes, Tom Shields and Caleb Dressel. That would have, that would have won the A final. That would have won the, the top one, wouldn't it? I, I, it was pretty good a pretty good b relay yeah, yeah. We, we did we did all right for sure yeah not bad so how do you feel about that gold medal yeah i mean it, it it's one of those things where it's like I, I don't think anybody dreams of being on the being on the prelim relay you know what i mean but uh but i think anything that we can do to to make it as easy as possible um for for our team to go on and win that gold i mean we're we're super excited to do that um and I, you know, those three guys you listed, I have a ton of respect for those guys. So, so being on that race and, and taking it really seriously and, and putting our, our A team in a, in a position to win, I, I do take a lot of pride in that. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you took the bronze in the, in the hundred individually, but you obviously got the gold because of the, the A team ended up being, I think it was Ryan Murphy, Cody Miller, Michael Phelps, and Nathan Adrian, pretty good A team, but, um, you know, obviously now people call you or introduce you, or maybe if it's on your, your resume or whatever, Olympic gold medalist, how do you feel about that personally? It's, it's weird, right? It's, it's kind of weird. Um, I, I imagine it'd be like if you were on a team sport and, and didn't get any playing time. Right. Um, yeah. Like I, I would m much more likely call myself a two-time medalist as opposed to Olympic gold medalist. Um, I probably don't, don't call it out as much. Um, that being said, I, I think it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it makes team USA better. Um, I, I really do believe that. And if, you know, if Murph doesn't have to race twice to, to be at his best to lead off with an Olympic, you know, world record, he broke the world record leading off that race. Um, mm. And you can kind of you can kind of set him up to do that, right? You can set you can set Phelps up to be great. You can set Cody up to be great. Um, and you always know Nathan's going to deliver on the end. Um, so so I do I, I take a lot of pride in it, but it's it is kind of a weird relationship with that gold. You're you're right. Yeah. Well, I've asked this of, of a few people that've been on my program, and um, you know, I guess for the the U.S. team, um, it, it's it's not an automatic, but certainly if you make a relay team for the U S you've got a pretty good chance that you're going to be winning a gold medal. Um, and so what, what I, I'm trying to do is help the future, you know, kids realize that, Hey, there's, um, 
you know, there's no shame in that medal at all. There's a lot of pride in that medal for sure. And, and like you said, you helped Murphy get that world record and, and help team USA win the gold. And, um, I think it's certainly something to be proud of, you know, but it, but I can see the, the, the tough, you know, dichotomy that you're in of like calling yourself an Olympic gold medalist at the same time, you know? Yeah. Right. And, and I kind of think about it the same way in like 2012, right. Of, you know, I, I wasn't happy with my race by any means, but, but I, I, I went 52 at that meet. So the two guys that went on to London had to beat a 52 long course hunter backstroker in order to make the team. Mm-hmm. And as much as like, you know, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to go out and brag about it to everybody, but I was, I took a little bit of pride and you know what, we, we made the team better. Um, that heat makes the team better. And, and I told that to, you know, everybody, I remember saying that to the team at, at world championships in 15, like, you know, you got it. We had a young team at that meet and, and we really, we underperformed a little bit, but I, I remember standing up and telling everybody like, you're supposed to be here. Everybody's supposed to be here. Like, don't, don't let imposter syndrome sneak in now. And if you, if you think that you're not supposed to be here, it's almost an insult to all those people you beat back home because they're good. They're really, really good. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's one of those cool things is like, again, nobody, nobody gets, sets out to win that, that third place bronze medal at the Olympic trials. It's the worst medal out there. But, but I did later on, especially, I was like, you know what, that hopefully I provided a little bit of value to those guys, made it a little bit tougher and, and helped them go on to win, win gold and silver in London. Well, man, like I said, I missed the Olympic team in 96 and had to wait four years. I can't imagine going through the, the, the three cycles that you went through and then finally making it. What's, what's your advice to someone who's, who, who look, not everyone's going to make the team next year. You know, what's your advice to somebody who just misses and then, you know, um, wants to keep going. Yeah. I mean, I do it for the right reasons. Um, and, and really think about why you want to do it. Um, I, I always give the advice that like, if you, if you have to do this, then you should do it with, with your whole heart, right? You do it with everything you got. You do it as hard as you possibly can. Um, but if you don't have to do it, if it's not, if it's not the biggest driver in your life, then it, it's also okay to let it go. Um, you know, I, I think that there's, there's so much, so much heartache in a, in a sport like ours and, and in all sports. Um, but if you can't put it down, you know, the big thing for me was like, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the guy who regrets not going after it. Um, so I'm going to go after it and I'm going to go after it as hard as I can. And I think the more you choose that, the more you intentionally choose that and reflect on why you're doing it, the, the better your chances are going to be. I love it, man. love that advice. Well, listen, I appreciate your time today and um, great stuff in there. So thanks very much, mate. Yeah. Appreciate it. Good to see you, bro. Yeah, absolutely. Take care. All right. See you.